apologies for the, uh, the the slow running there. Um, just wanted to say I found the last chat interesting. Uh, we've been using in my field, my former field, been using gravity models for uh, many years to help with retail location planning. And as the guys mentioned, my background is retail location planning. So I was going to try and take you through a, a quick chat about some of the, the rules I've learned over the last few years and uh, that have helped me set the scene for where I sit now in BT. Um, I guess I just wanted to do a quick slide here about my, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, quite a long history working in retail, uh, working for all those different versions of logos. So you can see that I was at Argos for quite a while. Um, my uh, my roost, most recently spent some time helping with the data, Consumer Data Research Council, who I'd recommend you speak to. Uh, great source for information. Some time with Easy Coffee, then at EE and BT. And on the right hand side, that is my favorite map. It's my son's map, clearly, it's not mine. Uh, the good news is he's uh, now studying law and not doing geography, but it's still my favorite map. I guess I uh, wanted to say that I think that generally think that maps uh, offer, well, they're works of art and they also uh, offer amazing insight into the world of business and how we can use that data to, to help people to do our jobs better and to take things forward. So over the last um, 30 years, um, I've pretty much been, been uh, well, I pretty much see Kirsty and Phil as my heroes. Uh, for those not aware of Kirsty and Phil, they run the TV show Location, 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 uh, which, which basically uh, underpins the British housing market, I think. Um, but this just flags to me how crucial location insights are into any business. Uh, they're crucial for pretty much every decision we can make these days. Um, not only does it help make the right decision, but it also reduces the risk, so helping any turnover and things. The, in the age of data science, uh, there's still a great deal of, um, of human interaction as well required. So I just want to try and walk, walk you through that story. I mean, I also wanted to share uh, John Snow's map of 1854, where he mapped a cholera outbreak that uh, hit Soho in London. And then we can obviously tragically fast forward 166 years to see uh, to see where we are today in the UK and, and worldwide, how we're just mapping COVID data. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, spatial insights, spatial location planning uh, in, in, in retail. When I joined retail, uh, many, many years ago, the uh, I think this cartoons from the 1990s. Um, honestly, spatial analysis was a lot more advanced then than, than this, this cartoon implies. But this Retail Week cartoon says it all possibly. And for those that know the Debenhams in the UK, uh, possibly not the, the best company and possibly some of their uh, ailments are due to their lack of spatial awareness. Uh, more... More commonly at the time, there was a lot of gut feeling into it, and genuinely one of the UK's uh, top food retailers in the 80s was picking his sights uh, from bus trips and helicopter trips over towns, working out where to put your supermarkets. Um, but come the 1990s, every all the major retailers were, um, were leading the way forward. Sainsbury's had invested in a, a GIS system that uh, took, took their business forward in, I guess, 1990. And when I graduated in 91, we were starting to use that one. Um, so there was a time prior to that when I was literally colouring in maps and working out drive times on a on a paper map. But that is the past. Um, I guess I wanted to chat and just help you help understand some of the, 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 the rules that I found most useful uh, that, that's helped me in my location planning over the last uh, few years. Um, for, for me, I try and make it easy, keep it simple, and try to help people to understand the three C's. Um, I think if you've got a really good handle on um, your customer, your catchment, and your competition, you can you can do a really good job of uh, explaining the story and, and, and the problems you've got to face. And we'll by explaining that story, you can obviously improve your performance and also reduce the risk. Um, these are cogs, they could be levers, um, they're not to scale, so depending on your environment, you flex the size of that cog to really appreciate how much impact all of those uh, those criteria have on your, your business. 
Um, so just a little bit more detail um, on them. Um, the catchment is that simple. Um, when we're looking at the town, are you looking at the city? Um, a new boundary I found most recently was the police authority area. Um, in BT, I'm looking at BT catchments, BT store catchments, BT telephone exchange catchments and where these guys run. So once you've understood your catchment, you know what you're working with. Um, next, you want to try and get some really strong insights into your customer, who they are, where they are, uh, why do they love or uh, dare, dare to sink it, why do they hate you? Uh, and also in retail, you also need to look at your online retail propensity, how much uh, they're going to be spending with you to get a view on that one. And then finally, you really want to understand your competition, where your competitors are, uh, where they're going to go next, and also to understand your online competitors, because more and more, obviously, they are driving the way forward. Um, Take on board all of those things and then then add in a, a fair fair sort of mixture of uh, making sure you apply the correct legislative uh, terms and any service agreements you've got because obviously we want to make sure we're treating data with respect. Um, more than ever, uh, spatial data uh, is is just about exploring, um, and that that map there is that, that picture there is obviously the uh, the bottom of the Lambaris path as you climb Snowdon. So this is all, all about exploring, and the spatial data world is, is ever-changing. Uh, we need to be thinking about all different data sources, where they're coming from, where the next generation of data sources is going to come from. So BT, we do a lot of work with the Internet of Things. Uh, we're looking at digital data sets, uh, possibly looking at housing data sets, movement data, and this is all data that's, I think, relatively new over the last few years, um, be those in the massive point of interest files, uh, things that you couldn't get a few years ago but a lot of people are still not using those to the to the right level um, but again with the caveat of uh, remembers in any, any relevant privacy rules but again for, for me um, and more and more in my new role in bt which is sort of like a spatial data uh, expert and analysis expert it's it's really all about the data um, again this is not to scale but um, it is three simple steps, but some people do forget this, some, some businesses even forget this, but it's all about finding that data, understanding that data, and then the really, for me, the really unbelievably important thing, and if there is one thing to take away from this, is all about socializing that data. Um, sharing data, so many people are, um, are continue to think of data as their own property when these days that data is a business asset and we need to be able to share that data and pass it on again, all within the bounds of uh, governance, but we need to be able to share that data around and make everybody get the best use of it. Um, I'd be interested to know, I can't hear anybody at the moment, but would be interested to know either in the questions or uh, or by text message later, um, if you've got any fine, found any new data sets lately. Um, I, I, I love tripping over new bits of data and um yeah if, if there are public data that you found that's really neat i'd love to hear about them from you later um we have got uh, I, I guess i just wanted to reiterate this challenge and i found this slide from blue conic um i think you probably all got experience internally that um so much data is held in these silos um there's there's not enough sharing of data uh what's this gartner saying uh, 87 percent of brands have uh, have low business intelligence and low analytic maturity, which is something I'm learning about having been a, a data user in the past and then moving on to more of a governance uh, type role um, that, that we need to start using the better data better and, and applying a lot more mature analytics. Um, and, and just to stress the fact that we have got most, basically too much data hidden away and uh, secreted away in too many silos. Um, I imagine that that will ring true for quite a few of you. Uh, if it's not, uh, that's brilliant news for your business, but um, I know in my experience that's, that's quite a problem. I guess I also wanted to share with you a couple of possible solutions. Um, if, if you don't know about these companies, these, these are actually charities and sort of um, um, 
uh, environments to share best practice. So you've got Informs, uh, that's a great uh, repository of data and insight. Um, they've got some amazing questionnaires. And also there's the, the DCAM, uh, Data Management Capability Assessment Model. It's a lot more interesting than it sounds, I believe. Uh, I, 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 can, well, I, can, I can vouch for. Um, I'd suggest that anybody interested in data quality uh, have a look at those two websites. Um, they are uh, charity-based organizations. Um, and, and the rule here or the suggestion here is to, to work with the experts who uh, understand that data from every single angle. Um, they, they're good at data, data governance, data science, data analysts, even down to the data citizen levels and the frontline teams, because they're all going to be using that, that data and make sure that the data is in the right format and of, of the best possible quality and accuracy. I guess, uh, having just heard from, from Booking.com and people like this, um, there is this massive uh, challenge towards data science, uh, spatial data scientists. Um, they are the, the best spatial data scientists, the ones that can tell a really engaging story about data and pass it on to everybody so you can best use it. Um, th those unicorns are quite rare. So I guess my request here, along with getting that data, socializing the data, is to engage with other people. So be that the, the spatial data scientists, chatting to the data provider, chatting to the teams that prepare the data, chatting to the guys that may be either in the field, be if you're in booking.com, the people that are on the ground in some of those res results, uh, if you're a retailer, the regional managers, but just to talk to people more and to share those insights, um, to collaborate as much as is humanly possible, um, and there will be a better outcome, um, and spatial data always adds to that. Um, I do try and, and talk what I preach. Um, so on the back of that, I, uh, I managed to bring together over 100 people uh, in, in face to face. This was when we were allowed to, uh, to meet up with more than six people in the UK. Um, so we had hashtag Spatial Analytics 2020, which was a mixture of external companies, some of whom are speaking today or this week, and, uh, and also um, an internal show and tell session. So it felt a little bit like school. But we brought together a whole host of spatial analysts, spatial data users, spatial uh, spatial data scientists in BT, and, and we we brought well, we just had a chat, had a show and tell. It's a bit like school. I brought home, brought in my favourite presentation, and uh, we, we just I guess learned masses about what the, the business is up to. Again, BT like any other business, we've got a fair few few uh, silos out there that just make it so valuable to be able to share these insights. I guess that is pretty much towards the end of my deck. Uh, apologies for the uh, chaos at the start. Um, I, I started this off with uh, what's the difference between Bedford, Buckingham and Broad Church. So most people uh, will, will hopefully uh, have, have a view what's what. Um, one of those is a made-up place. Uh, Broad Church is, isn't the real one, but you can actually search for Broad Church and find maps of Broad Church, as you can see here. So again, it's just a case of touching base with others to making sure you really know the right place. Um, and as that that is, yeah, be that you're speaking to the location planning teams, the the experts in the field, the people that are in the result, or uh, or, or live and breathe your data they're going to be able to add a little bit of extra value, whether that's uh, there's a market in the town that only happens once a month or occasionally or things like that. So the only, uh, the only like I said, the fact is that only one of those places isn't real. You can, you can recognize a, a few famous TV accent, actors there um, on, the, on the beach at uh, West Bay. West Bay is the real place. Broad Church isn't the real place. So I suggest... Uh, as I said, if you can get out and go and see some of these places you're doing spatial analysis on, I think it'll add value to the process um, and uh, and you'll enjoy getting out a bit more. What I can't work out here is how the TV guys made the uh, the Jurassic Coast there look so close to the pier because I'm standing in the same place there as David Tennant was, but uh, the TV <laughs> show makes it look a lot closer. 
Um, I've just heard a voice, so I can hear that somebody can hear me. So that's a good thing. I have rambled on for the last uh, 15 minutes. I think that's pretty much it, other than just, just a quick summary. Um, so what's the difference between Bedford, Buckingham and Broadchurch? Well, I guess, I guess you'll either know it or you won't know it. But if you don't know it for certain, and there's so many other places that are uh, that, that can cause confusion. Yeah. I mean, you've got different things in different maps that, that are either open, they've closed or whatever. It's always worth exploring for new data. Um, it, it, life is a life when it comes to data journey is a, is a is an exploring journey. So please keep looking, please sharing data, especially the free stuff that we can all access. Offer it around. If you're going to do some analysis, probably those three C's will help you uh, inform your analysis. Uh, think about the catchment, the customer, and the competition, and what they're doing, and that those will well improve your opportunities and reduce the risk. Remember, there aren't enough spatial unicorns out there, so please speak to the experts, uh, possibly Kirsty and Phil, and location, location, location really does add value. Um, but uh, if not, the worst case scenario, just, just look for that map, and I'm sure that map will uh, add some extra insights that you couldn't get from any other place. Um, hi, Andrew. All, all those points. Yeah, hi. Just thanks to everybody that's provided of big borrow and style on slides. But yeah, please think about sharing data. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your presentation. Uh, just to let you know, we did run a poll on your uh, question around the three Cs, and the overwhelming result was uh, that customer is the biggest driver for others who are joining us here on the, on the call today. Um, so, so yeah, interesting results. There's a question that's coming up a few times on various chats here. Um, about which departments within BT are the kind of power users of spatial analysis in particular with your experience so far? Um, BT is an amazing place, as, as I just get, uh, I've been here uh, sort of two years. Um, you've got the, the variation between some people are doing uh, national analysis of the 999 calls. So BT run the 999 uh, the first level of people that go into the 999 system. So they're using spatial stuff, uh, spatial insights, working out where people are. Uh, you've got EE, where to put a shop, where to open a store, um, where customers are. You've got teams that are looking at where to put broadband. Um, obviously, we've got a natural rollout opportunity, but do you put it in the, the most remote locations? So you're costing, costing locations on where, where you're going to put, put broadband. Um, understanding who the customer is using GIS techniques to understand the customer and to, to work out what, what offers are best for those guys. Um, yeah, and also the, we've also got a sort of a, a fledgling location active intelligence team that are looking to be able to commercialize and monetize some of our spatial insights that some of our competitors have been doing for a good few years. So where people are and uh, yeah, where they are really, I guess, in, in the immediate place so yeah bt is a massively uh spatially data powered organization and um yeah really enjoyable i think you answered uh, another question we had in the chat there from daniel Mohammed, who was asking if uh you bt share its data um so i guess you could that with the mobility insights uh comment there there's another question though about um when you're hiring into location planning, GIS roles. Um, there's somebody who's asked a question here, Fahim Rafi. Uh, is it necessary to learn Python or R for spatial analysis? How much does it benefit you in the modern days of location planning? Wow. Um, so just, just in terms of BT, yeah, they do, they do pass on some of the data. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a team there. If anybody wants to give me a shout, I can put that in the right direction. In terms of spatial data science, um, that's a difficult one. I, I, I'm, I've once or twice I've tried to learn uh, Python and failed miserably. I think um, it's, it's not essential to do spatial analysis because there's some fabulous tools out there that combine that data um, uh, and make, I don't know, de data democratization or map democratization, federalization of the mapping tools that allow the non programmer to, to do the analysis. So it's not essential. Um, I think there's an element of just um, spatial awareness. So the difference between Buckingham, Broadchurch, and, and Bedminster, or wherever, or anywhere else that begins with a B, 
um, just just to have some awareness of, of locality. Um, and remember, um, it's an analogy I've used once or twice. Um, even if you even if you were buying a house, you wouldn't do that based upon data science alone. You can look at a map. You can look at Google. You can look at the crime stats, the school stats, the health stats for your area. But you'd probably go and visit it as well. So um, they, 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 I guess where I'm going to is we need to, for the best spatial analysis, it's going to be a mixture of the best tools that isn't all spatial data science. Um, but it's just spatial awareness as well and uh, speaking to the right people. So I don't think you need to exclusively learn it. But if anybody wants to teach me, that would be a real challenge. But I'll uh, be up for that one. And a final question before we move on to the next speaker, Andrew. Uh, when it comes to sharing the location analysis that you do back with these different departments you mentioned earlier, whether that's retail store planning, network planning for broadband, um, what's the typical format? Are we still talking about slides, or are you sharing dashboards, apps that they can interact with? Um, I, I guess there's a bit of both. There's plenty of dashboarding, so you've got Tableau and Click. Uh, BT used both of those uh, in various degrees. Both of those have got spatial element, um, so there's there's a way you can definitely use all those uh, those dash dashboarding tools. Um, I don't think we're ever going to run out of PowerPoint slideshows, um, but uh, but yeah, so it's a mixture, I guess. And if you can offer allow customers, well not customers, your staff, your colleagues to use a mapping tool, uh, basic level, that's great. So sort of to be able to deploy. Uh, maybe a, a tooling click because mo most people just want to see a, a dot on a dot on the map to be able to see and visualize and, and work out I mean if you go back to John Snow's cholera map just to be able to see a dot on the map and a load of instances around that that's a lot of the insight that that many people need so it's a real uh, mixture of, of requirements but yeah dashboards are always good especially when they've got a map on them Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, anybody who, who perhaps has just joined and didn't get to see Andrew's session, uh, it will be available uh, afterwards on YouTube.